It's a celebration of all things two wheels. The iconic bikes, some of the superstars that rode them, a chance to see, hear and smell the wonderful machines of yesterday. Hi everybody, Greg Rust with you for the second annual Mike Perro Motorfest here at Hampton Downs. This weekend is something of a festival of motorcycling here and we've absolutely got it all. You can feel the immense passion between the fans and the constituents. We've got the very best national championship race and some of the most iconic bikes and the legends that race them from all around the world. The Mike Perra Motorfest here at Hampton Downs was huge in 2018 and Steve Parrish, it's gone next level this year, hasn't it? Yeah, it really has. The amount of bikes that have come in, we had a nice selection last year, but it's got ridiculous now with things like Moriwaki Kawasaki, we've got the Foggy Patronas here all the RGs and a whole bunch of full factory one that Crosby's riding. I keep thinking I'm back in about 1982 or something like that. I wish I was, actually. How good is this? Fans on the grid <laughs> celebrating everything that's great about bike racing. Yeah, and I don't get to race. Ah, But <laughs> but I'll, I'll, I'll give the old girl a good test out, that's for sure. But no, it's brilliant. Everyone gets to see the young fellas race, the super bike boys, and then we get to see the old boys make some smoke and noise so the fans see the old bikes. Perfect. The other side for me is I get to have a play on the V4 two-stroke 500. They just don't exist anymore. Last year was the first one. It seems to have doubled in size. We've got ACC here, we've got the Nationals, and we've got Classic Machines, so big event. To bring it all together, to have racing, to have trials, to have rides for people to go off and do, I mean, yeah. it's just tremendous. Oh, I saw a wheelie machine over there. You can learn how to wheel stand an R6 Yamaha. There's all sorts happening here. It's like a Mardi Gras. So very colourful. It's probably the biggest event you'll see in New Zealand, and it's going to get bigger every year. We're just here to help our sport, and uh, how can we make our sport more popular to young and old? It's so cool to get all the support from all the international riders. I mean, to see Simon here, Aaron, you know, some of the English guys coming out here, of course, Steve Parrish. To get them to come to our country, our little part of the world, on such beautiful bikes, I think it's very special. The atmosphere, the friendship, it's, of course things change, but looking back to come here historically and muck around with your best mates, nothing beats it. It's just the best feeling. We've got some cracking bikes and cracking friends. I think it's got everything. It's the New Zealand Superbike Championship round, so there's seriously competitive racing, and it's got all this as well, the nostalgia champions from years ago and, and world champions. I've got three boys out there racing, so I've got to keep them running. Then I'm talking at the rider safety, trying to side up, giving me speeches, then coming in here and doing this. But so many old faces and people I started with, and great machines as well. The fact there's people here, really excites me. The fact that people can race in front of spectators. The guys, even whether he's on a Jixa 150 or he's on a superbike, they've got people watching it, which is what we took for granted. I just love the fact we bring some people out to enjoy the sport. But look at them on the grid here. Where are you ever going to see that again? You're not, unless you wind the clock back. You're know, not allowed anywhere near it. So these guys can come and they can touch, they can talk to the legends that are out here and just get so close up. New Zealand being an island in the middle of nowhere, you kind of lose a little bit of the ability to see what actually MotoGP and Grand Prix is. But now, you know, 40 years later, we're actually bringing these old bikes back and people can actually see them and remember what they were like. The best thing for me is that I've reunited myself with a bike that I used to race in 1981. Some things have changed, not a lot on that bike, but me, it, you know, like it's a bit harder to get on the old bike and get off. Around the turn of the century, a young Aussie burst onto the international scene, mentored by the great Barry Sheen. Chris Vermeulen went on to win the World Supersport title, take 10 victories in Superbike, and of course, a very memorable win for Suzuki in MotoGP. These days, he lends his insights to Fox Sports motorcycle coverage in Australia, but he never misses an opportunity like this one to go for a ride. Tell us about the machine you're riding because it's got a bit of currency. The paint scheme also harks back to something important, doesn't it? Yeah, definitely. This is a British Superbike from about four years ago, sort of a 15, 2015, 16. So it's full World Superbike spec, full electronics. It's a bike Tommy Bridewell rode, and he actually put on pole position and had some podiums on this bike. But the colour scheme, they did a one-off race as a tribute to Barry Sheen at Silverstone in that year. So Steve Wheatman owns the bike, he owns a lot of collectible Suzuki bikes around the world. He's luckily lent it to me to ride, but it's it's fast, it's good fun and good to do a wheelie. Baz was special to you. At a very early age, he mentored you. Yeah, definitely. Barry Sheen was massive in my career. So I did a year racing in Oz, and I was the young kid doing quite well, getting the podium here and there, and Barry was the TV commentator. And a hero of mine, legend, he mentored me in lots of things, you know, 
doing interviews, you know, talking with sponsors, as well as riding the motorbike and took me to, to England for my first year in British Championship and on to World Championship. Anything I can ride with the number seven on. And, and when I was racing GPs, I was had a seven in my number, 71 or number seven. It's just a tribute to Barry and what a legend he was. And he still is. Valentino Rossi talks so highly of Barry Sheen. All those guys, they still remember what he did and he's done so much for the sport. You've had an amazing career, mate. You work in television nowadays in commentary. There's a lot to be proud of. Definitely. I had a great career. I was in Europe for more than 12 years, nearly 13 years, racing professionally. I remember my first World Superbike race win, my first podium with Phillip Island on a MotoGP bike. There's so many special moments, but winning a World Championship, that's something no one can ever take away from me, and I feel very proud of that. Aaron Slight rightly earned legend status in motorcycle racing, courtesy of 87 podiums in World Superbike. When you think about it, the Kiwi had a really impressive strike rate. Fans here also remember an intense rivalry with another great in Carl Fogarty and the iconic Castrol Honda Colours, which he's proudly wearing this weekend. Is it nice to pull those leathers back on again? It is nice, and um, I didn't really realise how iconic they are. Yeah, but when you travel the world, they will say, oh, it's a great colour, I love that colour scheme from the 90s, and yeah, it's quite neat. Tell us about the bike you're riding. Yeah, well, this is a VTR 1000, so this is the V-Twin, when Honda took on the, the Ducatis with their V-Twin, so I spent a couple of years developing this bike as a super bike while riding the RC45, but probably more passionate about the RC45, but the Castro Honda colour has just been there forever, eh? You had a great rivalry with Carl Fogarty during your career. There is a Foggy Patronus in this garage. Have you gone anywhere near it? I went over for a little photo, did a couple of one-finger gestures, just for a laugh. Yeah. But yeah, Carl joined the team in 1996, so he was a teammate back then, and, and we intermingled with the four-cylinder, and then he went back to the Ducati, so yeah, we had a, a long-term rivalry. But the British press did get on top of it, and you know, Sky Sport was based in England, and Motorcycle News, English magazine, so there was no social media in those days, so you did read all the, all the writing in it, and it was a little bit hurtful at the time, but it was great for the sport. We're not great mates, but you're competitors, you don't have to be friends, you know, and, and we're civil to each other. <laughs> It's fantastic that you're on a bike and you're, you're enjoying this. You and I reflected last night at, at the dinner that stopping wasn't really your decision in many respects, mate, and I would imagine that took a fair bit of time to deal with. Yeah, you almost tune your life to a little bit of a standstill after coming off a motorbike, you know, and, and the whole racing, 15 years in Europe, but it's hard to get the motivation to, to find something else, and, and what do you do? So the best thing for me was just to step right away from it. You've got to be there or be home, so step away from it was the best thing for me, and concentrate on the family and get other distractions. We're delighted to have Steve Parrish back with us this year. He is one of the real characters of the sport, a former 500cc GP racer, superbike team owner. He went on to become a media identity and a champion truck racer. He is loved as much for his racing success as his off-track antics. You were here for the first incarnation last year. What's year two look like from your point of view? Well, I'm surprised because normally I go back the second time to apologise, but they actually did want me here, <laughs> uh, which was really cool. And it's just getting bigger and bigger, and the organisation has kind of stepped up. Everything has. More people are coming in, more bikes are here. With perfect conditions out there, the track's in great order. They've resurfaced a bit where we had a bit of a problem with the bus last year because I think they dug in. So yeah, everything's really good and just wonderful to be back and everyone in relaxed form. That's the nice part about it. How much different is it to back in the day? Well, for a start, I actually switched from Suzuki before this model came out. I went to Yamaha. But this has been meticulously looked after. It's probably one of the best RG500s you could ever get from that era. It's an 83 bike. But I think worldwide, people are starting to realise that it was a halcyon period, wasn't it? It was that period where there was so much development going on and so many characters which, unfortunately, can you be a character now? When you're plucked from five years old, you're put in a junior championship, and then you're going into an academy, and then you go off to do this, it's gonna be hard to kind of have a fag behind the bus shelter and, and, and add that character to, to someone. That's a shame, because one of the guys that really made a, a great push into that space was your late great mate, Barry Sheen. He made such an influence, didn't he? He changed the world of motorcycling, certainly from my point of view, and probably from your point of view over this side, because he moved over to live in Australia. But yeah, Barry was the guy that took motorcycling off the back pages, the sports pages, and put them on the front pages. He was the guy that stopped you being that kind of black leather clad guy that was gonna go stealing handbags and chasing your daughter and things. Mind you, he still did chase the odd daughter, but truthfully, he was the guy that brought motorcycling up. I think it was said once that every guy wanted to be Barry Sheen and every girl wanted to be with Barry Sheen. So that was the sort of person he was, and he taught me an immense amount. I miss him 
enormously and he changed my life and many other people's lives and I wish he was here this weekend. He would have loved it, wouldn't he? Oh boy, there'd have been even more fun. I'd have got into even more trouble. The Mike Perrot Motor Fest is a wonderful celebration of just about everything two wheels. In addition to our jam-packed track schedule here, there are all sorts of industry pop-ups around the venue. Seriously cool demos of things like trials competition, incredible stunt shows, as well as ways for the enthusiasts to actually enjoy some riding and learn about all important safety. There are track cruises, test rides, and for those wanting to improve the rider racer skill set, Simon Crafer actually ran his internationally acclaimed Moto Voodoo program here for the very first time. No matter where you look, there is something for everyone to enjoy. Are you excited about doing this and the whole notion of Motorfest? Yeah, it's good to get back on the trials bike every now and then to have a play. It's really good to be here in this atmosphere. Good for the sport to get in amongst all this stuff happening this weekend. I came last year and really enjoyed the event, so I was looking forward to coming back. What can people expect from the show that you're going to put on here? Oh, they're going to get everything. You've got perfect weather. Here I can throw down everything nice and big areas. So all the technical circle wheelies, fast stoppies, stand on the tank. It's the flagship event for motorcycling New Zealand. So very honoured to be a part of it all. It's just a trail ride. It's a bit of fun through some farms and bits and pieces. I enjoyed it last year because come out and ride in the morning and then go and watch the race in the afternoon. The Shiny Side Up started about four years ago and it started off as a way for ACC and NZTA to talk to motorcyclists. We make up 3% of the vehicle fleet that's on the road, 16% of fatal injuries, which is terrible really. We've got $31 million in costs to ACC. We collect $28 million directly from motorcycle levies. The cost of registration is nothing compared to the cost of injuries. So not only when they're here watching the races and having a great time, you know, we've got to also think about getting home. So what we're doing here is we're offering an opportunity to come along, register for Ride Forever training, stay safe on the road. While you're here, go in the draw to win a Harley Davidson. While much of the focus here at Mike Perro Motorfest is on rider talent, the event also recognises those who've made a significant contribution behind the scenes, like Mike Webb. He grew up here in New Zealand and went on to become crew chief for some big names and has been an integral part of the MotoGP Championship since 2002, nowadays as race director. When was the last time where you're not with an official cap and you can just enjoy it? Oh, probably never. I mean, seriously, I, I just, I don't go to races in between races. And this is great. I've walked in here and I can see you chatting with some great old friends, mechanics, reliving some wonderful old stories. Oh, absolutely. I'm walking around this paddock here and it's just, I can't go two metres without seeing someone from 30 years ago. And, and to have like people like Mike Sinclair and guys that I worked, you know, side by side with not that long ago, it's really, really good to catch up again. You were a bit of a late bloomer in racing terms. And then the fact that you've gone on to have a great longevity in terms of the work you do in the sport. I didn't get started in racing until I was 25, so it was pretty much already over. So it was kind of knowing the right people and being in the right place at the right time, got into Grand Prix racing. I've been in the paddock for 28 years now. As one of those people in the paddock who's going, what are those idiots in race direction doing? You know, I've been on that side and know all those people. So now I'm the person making the decisions they're complaining about. But you get a respect, you know, we all know each other. We've all been around a long time. The riders know me and the teams know me. So you get a bit more credibility and understanding of, you know, how those decisions come about. I'm involved in writing the regulations technical as well. So we see the machine evolution. But race direction things, the safety things, that's moving on all the time. And it's a big focus of ours. We're lucky to have you here because you are literally about to jump on the plane and head off for a big year of MotoGP. Yeah, we're pretty busy. We had the last pre-season test in Qatar last week and I should have stayed on in Qatar for the Grand Prix which is next week but I'd fancied being in New Zealand for a few days instead. One of the bikes that came to define Grand Prix motorcycle racing in the 1970s and early 80s is the Suzuki RG500. Ridden to title success by the legendary Barry Sheen in 76 and 77 and also to a string of manufacturer titles. That wonderful history means that this is one of the machines to check out here at Motorfest and it's a bike that is very close to the heart of our Steve Parrish. Well, RG500 Suzuki's, if anyone asked me what's my favourite bike, it would be one of these, and probably I had my best times on it. This example here is the one I'm going to be riding. You can see it's got my name on it. It's even got my number six on the bottom here. 
And this one is actually a Mark 7, and it's probably the last time, about 1982, that you could go out and buy a bike that could win or even get on the podium at a Grand Prix. And it's such a pretty looking machine. It's four cylinder, it's a square four, producing around about 125 brake horsepower, obviously two stroke, as I wouldn't love it so much. This particular example is owned by Tom Dermody and Stuart Vaughan has something to do with it. And I love the bike. It's pretty much as it was built. It's in those wonderful Texco Heron Suzuki colors. Remember Barry Sheen won two titles, 1976, 77. This has moved on a little bit. It's got a monoshock system you can see down in there, as opposed to the twin rear shocks. Now, we're talking about 125 brake horsepower. In this day and age, it doesn't seem a great deal, but you've got to remember, in this era, people were driving around in Ford Anglias and Ford Cortinas. This was the ultimate, ultimate Grand Prix machine. And one of the guys that got to ride a bike exactly like this, this is a little bit later than mine, I'm going to butt in here just one second, because I've got Mr. Graham Crosby right here. Graham, that would be a bike pretty much exactly as you rode it back in the day. Well, as I followed you around on them. <laughs> well, you didn't. You nicked my job, actually. I was riding one of those, but you, this is the later But I never raced one with the monoshock system and stuff like that, but you helped develop all that. Yeah, we, that was a, a, a transition in, in 80, 81, really, when we went from a twin shock to a, a monoshock, which was kind of really out there. The 81, 82 RG500s were probably the best there was. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. But you had the factory one. You got behind us over here, and that was yeah. just that bit better, obviously refined. A lot of parts weren't interchangeable, but they looked the uh, same. The good thing is that whatever we did as a factory bike appeared the next year so the privateer in effect was only ever a year behind it was an era where you got hassled by people going out and buying bikes they'd be right behind you it was a bit annoying really wasn't it yeah there wasn't i don't think there was enough of difference between the factory bike and the production bike any young kid could get on it and it'd be right up your tailpipe but it was just the salary was better on the factory bike oh at least what, salary salary yeah yeah as well as track cruises, stunt riding and legends demonstrations, the Mike Perro Motorfest saw plenty of on-track action as part of the third round of the New Zealand Superbike Championship. Making the most of an opportunity to shine in front of a big crowd, the racing was fierce, with the prestigious New Zealand Tourist Trophy races highlighting the weekend. In the incredibly tight Jixa Cup race, Jesse Stroud, the son of nine-time New Zealand Superbike champion Andrew, took home the Tourist Trophy. Likewise, brother Jacob Stroud convincingly won both the Superlight and Hoyasung Cup races. Superbike Championship frontrunner Daniel Metham also found success in post classics, while Kevin Goddard won the Shuey GP two strokes round from Taran Ocean and event sponsor Mike Perro. Yanni Shaw dominated 125 GP, and Nathaniel Diprose was similarly strong in Supersport 300. Leon Jacobs won 250 production, while Peter Goodwin and Louise Blythe were too good in the fan favourite sidecar race. Supersport 600 was huge, with the races providing plenty of action. Out front, the battle for the Tourist Trophy came down to Toby Summers and Avalon Biddle, with Biddle making her move on the final lap to take the win by six thousandths of a second. The final superbike race saw plenty of contenders try to stake their claim for the Tourist Trophy. But like Supersport, it came down to a two-horse race, with Daniel Metham and Scott Moyer streaking ahead. After coming so close the previous two years, this time it was Daniel Metham who got to hold up the Tourist Trophy. He's now the homegrown voice of the global MotoGP coverage. But before that, Simon Crafar was a rider to be feared. Winner of the British Grand Prix toward the end of the fearsome 500cc era, he admits that he struggled when he ultimately stopped racing. But Crafar never lost the passion, and he reinvented himself, sharing his knowledge in the pit lane and creating a world-class rider training program. I uh, actually landed Thursday morning at 4.30, went to Mum's, had a quick shower, arrived at the track, and we had, through the day, classes basically to help people ride on track. So after the class, they could go out and play with the things that I'm trying to show them. You know, we had a whiteboard and show them lines, why this is so important. It seemed like they were pretty happy. So, yeah, hope we get to do it next year again. It's a project that you are absolutely passionate about, aren't you? Yeah, for sure, because I had to learn it the hard way, and it came from lying in bed for best on 11 months trying to get walking. It was a road accident actually, head on with a car that came around the corner, blind corner on my side of the road, you know. Oof. 
And um, basically, it, it changed my life, you know, for the better. And I thought, I really want to do something that I'm proud of again, but like I was in my racing. And I've ridden bikes all my life and learned all this. Basically, there's some books out there that I didn't agree with, you know. I thought maybe that's done in the 70s, I don't know, but you don't do that now. So I wanted to go through and make a modern version of how to ride a bike fast on track, and that's what it is. Stopping the racing and finding the next path was a difficult thing for you. You know, you don't think it's going to be hard because I was in a good position financially. You know, I'd raced for a long time and the last years went really well. So I'd paid for my house and had some money in the bank, enough to run the family. And But that's not enough, you know, if you're used to trying to get the best out of yourself. I mean, I'm no doctor or whatever, but I think I got a bit depressed in those years after um, because my best trusted mate told me that I was getting angrier every time I saw him. I, I just went, whoa. So I had to figure out that since the accident, I put my heart into the book and films and the teaching thing. But also the accident made me realize that my wife and kids were the most important thing. I think you have to be lying in bed and you think you can't walk or make love to your wife or play with your kids again to realize that all that other stuff I was chasing is a load of rubbish. I mean, it's crazy, isn't it? I've only got 40% power left in my right leg, 60 my left but it's enough to have life quality and I don't care it's still turned my life around for the better. You'd be congratulated, mate, but now you're sharing those insights in the pit lane for MotoGP. Are you enjoying that side of it, and how have you found that transition? Yeah, it was a dream, you know, like to get offered the job, and I didn't see it coming. You know, I was focused on my school, and I thought I'd be all right straight away, and I wasn't. I fell on my face lots, made lots of mistakes, because there isn't any training, you know, and I'm doing it at that level where it was hard, you know, and so I was pretty average and I uh, got a slating on social media, and uh, but I was really determined to be good enough that they signed me up for the second year. And uh, yeah, I got there good enough that they'd sign me up again, and now it's one year, I'm really enjoying it, you know? I'm so glad I pushed through that anxiety, heart palpitations, uh, and then your brain freezes and then you muck up. I'm so glad I pulled through all that. We are too, mate. Go get them and have a fantastic 2019. It's been lovely to chat with you. Cheers. Thank you. That wraps up the Mike Perro Motorfest for another year. We hope you've enjoyed it. Don't forget, Hampton Downs is a great destination if you're into anything two or four wheel for that matter, with all sorts of regular events like caffeine and gasoline. A good excuse to come and admire some great machines and enjoy some coffee. So stay up to date on the website, follow us on social media, and we'll catch you next time. Bye for now.